I'm going to just give you a little bit of kind of background to where we're going now. I hope you enjoyed the morning sessions, um, and it was very interesting in my session. I met a lot of people working independently, people working in museums, uh, people working uh, in circuses, uh, in libraries, in education, commercial sector, voluntary arts. It was an extraordinary range of people, and I, it was an more, even more extraordinary moment to think that was happening 20 times around London. And I just feel like something different is happening here. It feels different to me. Um, also something that feels different is that this is, yes, about short term. Of course, people are focusing on the next three months, but actually also we're thinking about the next three years. We're thinking actually about the next 30 years. This is a long debate. It's a long conversation, and there are short-term actions, but there are also long-term things to think about. Um, in terms of the What Next meetings that have been happening around the country, um, they have been brainstorms. They happen around a table, um, and they are brainstorms where we get together or people get together and agree actions and shared agendas. So in a room of 650 people, uh, we are now going to try and do that. Um, we don't have a big enough table, but we are going to give it a go. So this afternoon, we hope that you will uh, become very much part of the conversation. The afternoon is broken into three sections from this point. The first part is that a bunch of people are going to come uh, up here who've already been part of What Next Conversations, either in London or around the country, and they've got some starting points, some ideas, some provocations, if you like, um, but very, very much as seen as starting points. That will last about 40, 45 minutes. Then the second part is when we will all go and talk to each other um, in a spirit of open space to explore some ideas together, to have coffee, tea in the circle bar and the downstairs bar, and we will share ideas, ideas that you're having that you think we should be focusing on together. And the third part will then be a chance to bring all of that back into this room and have an intimate conversation with 649 other people where you can present your thoughts and present your ideas and there will also people, be people here who can share and reflect on your thinking. Um, when you came in, you should have been given this. Has everyone got one of these, this, this card, an ideas for action card? If you have got one, please yeah, pull it out, make sure that you've got it in front of you because it's going to be important this afternoon. Each of the set of speakers who comes on now is going to um, suggest an action. And the action that they're going to suggest is on this card. Um, and if you feel motivated or excited or you want to get engaged in that action, then please mark your card as we go through this afternoon. Um, there is also a, a space for your action, too. If you think there is something that is really important that we collectively need to be doing but that isn't on this card, then please make a note of that, and then you'll have the opportunity to talk about that later on this afternoon. A um, couple of quick digital notices. Uh, it, this event is being live streamed. Um, so uh, for those that are watching on the live stream, um, if, you want to, if you don't have one of these in your hand, um, you can go to whatnextculture.co.uk. That's whatnextculture.co.uk. And on that is a website which has the ideas for action and other information about what next. Also, the hashtag for anybody who's tweeting is uh, hashtag WN2013. So as we go through this afternoon, if actually you're going to take an action, uh, whether it's your action or whether it's somebody else's that you are sharing, I encourage you to tweet that action. It, wouldn't it be interesting to see if we could uh, get this event and uh, trending or whatever, whatever it's called? <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Okay, I'm going to move on now to the first part uh, of the three-part structure I talked about, and um, I'd like you to welcome to the stage, please, Marcus Davy from the Roundhouse and Roundhouse, and Ruth McKenzie, who's producer and consultant. Good afternoon. In a second, there should be a list of all the MPs in the country scrolling down behind us. Obviously, many of you have a great working relationship with your local MP. We'd like to hear those stories, and uh, if you could share them with us, please email them to us so we can share them out and we can learn why they've worked well, why that relationship has worked well, and also maybe tell us what hasn't worked well. Um, it's really important for us to get a relationship with a local MP, um, many of us can tell that story, but who better to tell you that story than somebody who's been a special advisor to five Secretary of State, but also most recently has won our great Olympics Festival. Please welcome Ruth McKenzie. Um, and as Marcus says, thank you. Uh, 
the most important stories are your stories. And many of you, I know, have fantastic relationships with your local MPs. So forgive me if with my six years of experience of working with MPs, I'm already teaching grandmothers to suck eggs. But just for a few of you, um, my top tip would be make friends, not demands. So how do you make friends with your local MP? Well, most MPs have as a top priority responding to those that live in their constituency. And as What Next discovered in its early days, rather than you approaching them directly, find one of your fans. Find a parent, maybe, of a young person who's coming to one of your educational events, or a young person themselves, although MPs are also very responsive to people of voting age. Uh, so f ask a parent if they would write to your local MP and invite them to come to an education event, to something where it'll be clear what the benefit is, something where you can begin to make friends with them. But rather than having a generic letter, have a specific letter, because again, MPs can spot a campaign, and you're not after a campaign, you're after a long-term relationship. So in, get one of your fans to invite your MP to come to see an event at your cultural institution. Be there, of course. Begin the dialogue. You'll know that you've done it when you can exchange mobile phone numbers. What you're after is being a trustworthy friend, starting a long-term relationship. About long-term meaningful relationship, this is about courtship, not campaigning. So. Um, if you can look onto the What Next website, you'll find the full list or a link to the full list of MPs. Make that relationship. Thank you very much. So you'll see uh, on your pledge cards uh, or your ideas cards um, this. And if you want to engage with that, um, I'd like to underline something Ruth said, which is we know that there will be many, many innovative and playful ways that people are already doing this. And actually, what next is about bringing people together in order to share the things that they're doing and share good practice. So when we come on later, if people have got things they would like to add to that, please do. OK, I'd like to now welcome um, to the stage our next group, which is Dave Moutry from the Corner House in Manchester, Jude Kelly from the South Bank Centre, Jill Toffey from Mulberry School, and Robin Simpson from Voluntary Arts. Good afternoon. Um, uh, we're going to talk about some of the ideas that come up by our group um, and that have already been introduced. Could we have um, my first slide up, please? Um, uh, are there any Manchester United supporters in the, uh, in the audience? Anybody? We're in London, so there must be. Uh, any? Um, what you're going to see is going to be grossly offensive. This is Manchester City's training ground. Um, this this, this um, uh, training ground, which has been constructed at the moment, We'll have uh, 16 pitches, a 7,000-seat stadium, an academy school, a sixth form college, and regular community use. Although Manchester City Council, uh, sorry, Manchester City Football Club is a big money machine, like all Premiership teams, it, it, it has deep roots into the community. Um, uh, in sport, that continuum between the school and the voluntary um, uh, uh, through to elite is not an issue. Um, uh, sport England work proactively across this spectrum. Big money sport, where it's uh, really smart, knows that deep roots pay dividends in a world where brand loyalty means everything. Okay? Now, um, a bit further on, in one of the slides coming up, you'll see Watershed in Bristol. Um, it's not a big money machine, but like many museums and galleries and theatres and concert halls and festivals and orchestras across the UK and Ireland, it's deep roots in its community. Dick Penny, the CEO there, has, is, is Dick here today? No? Oh, good. I can embarrass him then when he's not here. Um, Dick has got Bristol written through him like Blackpool through rock. Um, um, he's, he's involved in everything, and the voluntary sector uh, is, 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 is also uh, very important to him. So as an arts sector, um, we need to have a different attitude, perhaps, to the continuum. Uh, some people already do have. So one of the ideas that came out of our conversations was that we, maybe we should be holding quarterly dinners, not for our big donor, donors. We look after our big donors, but maybe we should be holding quarterly dinners for, the, uh, for people who run voluntary arts organisations, people involved in community groups. Um, uh, head teachers, teachers who share our interest, and, and make them part of the conversation with our artists. Ah. Oh. There you go. Um, um, the, 
the other thing is make sure that they're on our first night invitation list. Are they coming on? Our, are they, do they come to our previews, our private views, etc.? Okay, so um, involve and connect them. I'm going to hand you over now to Jude. <laughs> I don't work. Okay. Um, very pleased to be here, to be with my accomplices as well, uh, Jill and uh, two friends from Mulberry School. Um, behind me, I think there's going to be a rolling set of slides. Um, and if they come up, I will tell you that they're, they're fairly arbitrary. They're not all the UK. Um, but what they show are people of all ages, not just young people, engaged in playing creatively and engaged in playing creatively so that they can sharpen the skills that are natural to all of us of trying to work out what is your place in the world and therefore what could you be for the world. And most of us are working alongside projects of this nature and including them in our, in our practice. But ways of seeing uh, affect what we think we know. And the relationship between formal arts and culture and education has been a, a partnership that's been growing and changing and has taken steps backwards as well as steps forward. If our way of seeing things is that we all feel as professional practitioners that we are linked indivisibly from the relationship with learners, we are learners, everybody's a learner, and that we are engaged in the idea of how creative play can be formalized uh, and become a tool to how we live, then we won't see ourselves as a sector that sometimes engages and sometimes doesn't engage with schools and education at all levels. And if we didn't see ourselves as separate, if we saw ourselves as absolutely linked, then maybe we would see that some of the conversations we had around the table could never be complete if it was only with ourselves, but always had to include those people who were actively engaged in the learning that we speak of as being so important. We've spent years building coalitions between educationists of all kinds, but we still sometimes find ourselves within our own establishments as a way of seeing being that a small group of sometimes poorly paid edu arts educationalists do the work of bringing in those projects and those relationships. And as a way of seeing, that would suggest to everyone, including government, that that link to education is a nice to have and an optional extra, but not core. And if we do think it's core, then a way of seeing has to be a way of enacting that in the kinds of partnerships and relationships that we make and hold on to. And that may in itself influence something that we've been trying to do for a long time, which is get ministers of arts and ministers of education to themselves feel that they are indivisibly linked in some way. So we've been thinking about that and suggesting that it's a, it's a conversation or a set of conversations which are more urgent now and, and need to be more formalized. We have a set of things that we would like to suggest in a minute, but before we do that, I'm going to hand you over to, to Jill from Mulberry School. We work a lot with Mulberry School and learn a lot from Mulberry School pupils. Thanks very much, Jude. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Okay, I'm all right. So thanks very much. It's so fantastic to be here this afternoon to be able to have this opportunity to talk a bit about our school and for you to meet some of our fantastic pupils. So Mulberry is a school in Tower Hamlets. It's a state school. There are 1,500 pupils on roll, and of those 1,500 pupils, 97% are of Bangladeshi British heritage. We have a sixth form in the school, um, and the school has at its heart the arts. We are a specialist school for the arts, even though the requirement to uh, be a specialist school has been removed. We still call ourselves a specialist school for arts work because we feel it's at the lifeblood of our school. So we see what drives our school forward as, as a wheel, and the arts are very much one central spoke of that wheel. So I'm just going to ask one of the, our wonderful students just to say a bit about why she thinks the arts are important to her at Mulberry. Would you like to say that? The arts are important because it just gives you one moment to speak your thoughts and like it's like the whole world has to be quiet to listen to you. It evokes this passion from you and you can create anything with that passion. And I believe one person's passion is someone else's inspiration. Thank you. So powerfully put, I think, really. Um, and 
If you ask any of the pupils at Mulberry, they will be able to, to articulate the same kind of ideas. So when I say we put arts at the heart of our school, we have the English Baccalaureate at our school, but we, in Key Stage 4, arts are a compulsory subject because we believe absolutely that without that, students would not be successful. So I think... Uh, also, we, we, in year nine, which is uh, traditionally quite a difficult year sometimes for students, uh, particularly students for whom learning is not necessarily a natural path that they walk down, uh, we have a, a play that every single class puts on a play. We call it the Year Nine Project. It starts in January and it continues to June, and that's where we put our focus. Now, we're in a strong position because the school is a very successful school. We have really high exam results. And so I suppose what I'm saying is that we are a school that has proven that the arts are a, school, are, are a tool for school improvement and are integral to everything that we do. And there are lots of other arguments that around social justice, who goes to the theatre, who takes part in arts events. Most of our students would not, I think it is true to say, go to the theatre if the school wasn't taking them. They wouldn't take part in arts events. Uh, all of these things are crucial. The other social justice argument, very strong social justice argument, is around what the arts do to build confidence in young people. So if we want to take those things, a sense of belonging, confidence, pride, self-respect, if we really believe, which I know everyone in this room will, that those are the things that we need to be teaching our young people, then that's what the arts can do. Do you want to say anything about that? Do you think that's something that might be true? Um, I agree personally because I came all the way from Austria to London for the arts and English because as in Austria they only do French as their second language and they don't do arts. I have a friend that doesn't do arts in their school and he says that it's absolutely high minding because um, you can't step out of the box and you can't express your feelings. Now, whereas in arts, you don't have to directly say something because it's not like maths or science where it's wrong or it's right because you say it in a sense that they have to infer and deduce what you're trying to mean. Thank you. So, around... Thank you. It's around experiment and risk and having the space to do that. So I just very quickly want to say, if that's okay eight things that we want to do as a school and that we would like to reach out on. So the first one is really just to be resilient. We are determined to be resilient and hold our ground, build what we know is right, constantly ask the young people in our school if this is what they would like. And as long as they are telling us that this is their lifeblood, then we will continue to do that. So reach out to any like-minded people, really, who would like to come and join us and be partners in that. The second thing we will continue to do is invest in the arts. We've just built a new theatre and that money has come from an underspend that a very uh, careful, frugal previous head teacher had. So some of the money has come from that and some has come from other sources. So we had to decide what was the most precious way to spend what is very precious public money. Could have built a new science wing, we decided to build a new theater. It's brand new, it's just opened. We would like to reach out to people who would be able to help us with the running of that theatre, and also anyone who wants to use that as a space. It's a new resource for London, and in particular for our community. You're welcome. Um, our third, our third uh, idea is that we, it's very exciting. We now have the opportunity, we've been granted uh, permission by the department to open a university technical college, which is which, the curricula of which will be employer-led by the creative industries. So a chance to look at making a real curriculum that's around creativity. Employ the best teachers, that goes without saying, in the arts, and employ other people, like my colleague who's sitting in the audience over here as a head of creativity. Teachers don't have enough time necessarily to, to, to be involved in lots of creative projects, so you need other resources. We've just, on Friday, um, uh, uh, promoted a head of voice at our school, and the other things I want to say really quickly are I want to thank our arts partners, Jude at the South Bank, the National Theatre, the Young Vic, the Don Mar. Without them, we couldn't be successful. And so if there is any talk of funding being cut to those organisations, it would be a disaster. And finally, just to say what we want to do is live up to the strap line of our school, which is confidence, creativity, leadership and a love of learning and enable all of our young people like these wonderful young women here, to go on and be the builders of our new creative day in Britain. That's what we want. Thank you. Okay.
So uh, what you're seeing is something of what David was attending to in his opening speech, which is that the voices of the people who are actually doing it are the voices that people need to hear to understand that this isn't a sector it isn't a sector that is a movement about its own self-preservation for its own sake. It's actually on behalf of many people who can speak on our behalf very, very eloquently, as the two young men with Penny did as well. So things you could do. Join or encourage staff to join local boards of school governors or the boards of local communities or voluntary organizations. Link people together. Work with schools to reach parents and get parents to speak on our behalf about the work that they value and then invite a voluntary or community leader or local business or young person or MP to join our boards. I know that we're all doing this already, but let's never forget that we are, need to show, we need to have people see that we are linked to people and that those people are our advocates. Thank you. Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is a wholly remarkable book. The introduction begins like this. Space, it says, is big, really big. You just won't believe how vastly, hugely, mind-bogglingly big it is. I mean, you may think it's a long way down the road to the chemist, but that's peanuts to space. What next is a national conversation on new ways to champion the arts and culture. Well, the arts and culture is big, really big. The arts and culture is big. You might think there are a lot of arts and cultural organizations in this room today, but you are peanuts. Or possibly 650 loan nuts. Research commissioned by DCMS in 2008 tells us there are 49,140 voluntary and amateur arts organizations in England alone, regularly involving 9.4 million people. Oh, you're thinking, he's just talking about the amateurs. Well, yes. And here I think we need to look at what Douglas Adams called the fundamental interconnectedness of all things. If we're going to make an effective case for the arts and culture, we need to be looking at the whole cultural ecology. We need to embrace those vast swathes of amateur activity and the commercial sector, not just that small number of arts and cultural organizations that get government subsidy. How many professional actors began their lives as amateurs? How many professional musicians started their careers earning a living by performing with amateur societies? How many theatres are reliant on amateur bookings? A couple of years ago, my organisation, Voluntary Arts, started a project with the Royal Shakespeare Company, which became known as Open Stages. Our aim was to break down the barriers between professional and amateur theatre. And the result of the project was 263 amateur Shakespeare productions across the UK the best of which were showcased in Stratford-upon-Avon at the Royal Shakespeare Theatre as part of the World Shakespeare Festival last summer. But the main thrust of the project for us was a series of regional skills sharing sessions around the country which brought together professional theatre companies and amateur theatre groups. And what was fascinating about those sessions was the way in which they were genuinely two-way skills sharing events with learning on both sides. It was fascinating to see a group of amateur theatre people um, uh, quizzing the technicians at the Royal Shakespeare Theatre, but it was equally fascinating to see uh, a young associate director from the RSC learning from a woman who directed Shakespeare for more than 30 years in an amateur context. For years, we might have thought we were doing experiments on the mice. Maybe the mice have been experimenting on us. Amateur activity is not worse or better than the professional equivalent, but the amateurs bring different qualities, particularly that quality of real-world experience. The Royal Navy Theatre Association was one of the groups we showcased at Stratford last summer, and their production of Much Ado About Nothing 
which, as you may know, starts with soldiers coming back from a war, featured service personnel who had just come back from Afghanistan, bringing a different level of meaning and understanding than any, any professional actor might have done. I wasn't banking on having to do this one-handed. The title of the section is called Unlikely Alliances. And I'm here to encourage you to make connections between your organizations and amateur arts groups and other community organizations. Because the arts doesn't just happen in arts organizations, professional or amateur. The arts happens in adult learning, through evening classes and colleges, in community organizations, women's institutes, young farmers clubs, in schools and in charities. Yet I would suggest that these sorts of alliances are not unlikely. In fact, on a, a scale of improbability, I would suggest these are not at all improbable. In fact, I would suggest they're blindingly obvious. Perhaps for some years we've been working in the arts under the effect of some infinite improbability drive. It feels, thankfully, as if improbability levels are now decreasing and we're approaching normality. So what we'd like to encourage you to do is to consider starting by hosting round tables with local cultural organizations, inviting local MPs, councillors, and businesses to come to talk about the social and economic value that culture contributes to that local area. We'd like to use these meetings to explore the complete cultural ecosystem of an area, understanding the components that together form that culture and how they are interconnected and interdependent. This is how we will make an effective case for the arts and culture. This is how eventually we will begin to discover the answer to life, the universe, and everything. I'm going to move us straight on, but the pledge there or the, is around unlikely alliances. And I know there's a lot of people in this room who do this already, and we'll hear from you this afternoon with interesting ways that you've been going about this. Can I now welcome, please, to the stage, Alistair Spaulding from Sadler's Wells, Topher Campbell from the Red Room, and Gavin Strive from Farnham Maltings. Cheers. Hello. Um, actually, on the internal briefing document, it said that Alistair Campbell was going to introduce this, uh, which would have been amazing, wouldn't it? <laughs> I'm afraid it's me. Um, David, uh, at the beginning, said that we've never really won the argument uh, with the public in, in terms of the, the place they, the, the value they place on the arts in their daily lives. And, um, and I think that's really one of the kind of biggest aims of what next so far is to try and win that argument with the public. And we were thinking, well, what's the best way of trying to achieve that? And of course, one thing that unites us all as uh, organizations is we have mailing lists. Um, and what this uh, section is about is trying to think differently about how we use uh, those mailing lists. So, of course, we use them at the moment to invite people to uh, come and see what we do. What we're suggesting is that we also use those mailing lists to inform the wider public about the impact we have on their local communities, on regeneration, um, and on education. So. To, to use our existing communication tools in a different way. I mean, there's probably about 200 organizations represented in this room alone. Um, and say you all have 20,000 people on your mailing lists, then already we've got 4 million people that we can go to. Um, and if we think, for example, when we did the EBAC campaign, about how we could have utilized those four million or even more people uh, to, to back our argument that there should be uh, art subjects at, uh, at, at uh, O level, GCSE level, uh, then we would have had much more powerful argument. So we're asking you today to think about opting, uh, writing to your uh, mailing list, to the people, to your memberships, uh, to, to the people that come to your organizations um, and s asking them to opt in to, to receiving information about what's next and the uh, issues that we face. Um, now, we're not talking here about creating a separate database. 
what we really want to do is to be in a position where you are talking to your participants or your visitors or your audiences directly. So um, as we say uh, jokingly at What's Next, the Politburo will decide the messages, uh, and then you will um, talk to your uh, people. So it's a direct communication, uh, and we can maybe try and achieve some of our goals. There's two potential uh, wins here. One is a short-term one. So if, if we say 4 million, say we say 10 million, say we say 15 million people on a list that we can go to to get behind our actions, then that may, that may cause some change in the thinking in government. As I said, if we had that when we were talking about EBAC, it would have been even more of a case uh, to get Michael Gove to change his mind, which he did. Thank you. Longer term, we can start to really change the way um, that politicians, stakeholders, and decision makers, uh, the, the value that they place on the arts. So there's a long-term aim to keep coming with messages which at some point might inspire the public to therefore inspire the politicians that represent them to, to sustain investment in the arts. The other part of this is to ask uh, your, you chief executives and artistic directors, when you're speaking to your audiences, either through your season brochures, newsletters, or in public speaking engagements, to include some of these messages uh, when, you're, when you're talking. Because I don't think we really do uh, talk enough about how our organizations are funded by the Arts Council, and that's taxpayers' money. We don't articulate these things enough. So I'm getting the thing, so I'm going to stop. Um, I've got two colleagues here who, um, who are already doing this kind of thing in their own organization, and Topher Campbell is going to start off in the Red Room. Hi. Um, the um, the uh, thing that I uh, wanted to do while I was here was tweet quite a lot about the, the conference, um, because uh, the Red Room is a very small company, and we depend a lot on, on the internet. Um, and it's really for those, I'm really speaking to those uh, small organizations uh, who don't have 40,000 people on their, their, um, on their database, or even individual artists who are working in the arts for various different organizations. Um, the Red Room is a small organization with a uh, little infrastructure, no building as well. Um, and also, we do projects with long intervals in between. This means that we have to find in innovative ways of keeping in touch with our audiences, participants, volunteers, and those interested in what we do. Um, we attempt to reach the thousands on our database through continuous contact using Facebook, Twitter, and Tumblr, particularly in between, sometimes within a year between productions. We embrace the internet as an inter integral part of our creativity and identity. This is because we believe the internet is, a popular, is the most popular place where participation takes place. And uh, we very much see this as uh, the use of our online platforms as the opportunity to have a long two-way conversation about things that interest us and things that interest our audience and our participants. Um, it's a process that strengthens our work whilst also enabling us to understand our audiences and our, and our participants, participants better. Uh, so the idea is really to think, perhaps if you are a small organization um, with no building or no, without a large infrastructure, perhaps uh, you can think about innovative ways of having a conversation about what next with the people who engage with your work. And um, in doing so, perhaps you also can, with your local conversation, impact upon the national conversation and hope to um, impart the importance of culture in our society along with the rest of the 620 and other affiliated, affiliated audience members uh, around the country. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um. <laughs> So, uh, eight years ago, um, I read a book by Charlie Ledbetter called We Think, um, and its central argument was that in the past we were defined by the things we owned, and in the future we'll be defined by the things we share. And so, um, I thought that was a good idea, so I started all my conversations with, well, what do we think rather than what do I think? Uh, and I work in the southeast, and... Um, from that came a very loose association of people who shared an ambition to see if we could make a difference. And that loose association of people became House. And um, 
house is a network now of 110 venues spread across the south, east and the east. And, and there are some principles which have stayed true to us right from the beginning. And they are that it's not about us at all. We, can't, we have to be the, the last people to benefit from any of our activities. Um, that uh, it wasn't about money. And it, it is fair to say that arts councils and others have started to invest in some of our ambition and that's been curious, really, because that wasn't our intention when we set out, and we looked to use that money across the whole of the, the whole of the region. And the third thing was that we wanted to work at making sure that our ambitions were the same as our audience, and that there was some concern that in the last spending review and the Arts Council's current 10-year policy, artists and audiences were de dis described as separate ambitions, and our feeling was that if we better connected those we might get to the third ambition which is resilience so out of that now 110 and growing kind of weekly um, venue network we do a whole heap of things but what started to happen now is a debate amongst us saying well if each of us has got not never mind a database of audience but friends people who've already declared an enthusiasm or support for a particular audience uh, sorry organization of you know, who knows, 1,000, 1,500, then, then you start to see a potential friends support network for collective ambition across just the southeast region of half a million people, and that has to be powerful. So now we're starting to go, well, how do we send out a message about shared ambition? Um, uh, and it feels like many of those things are exactly the same uh, enthusiasms, ambitions of what next. Thank you. OK, um, I'm beginning to aware that we're probably becoming a really weird cast of a West End play assembling on stage. <laughs> so I think it's probably time for us to go. Um, we're going to have a break now, um, but just before you go, I guess, I would just say th uh, one thing about those three ideas, those three sets of ideas and provocations that you've been offered, um, is that in my head it helps almost to think of them almost as concentric circles in terms of their reach. You've got in the, in the center of that circle, MPs, and the role that we can play in connecting with our MPs. Then you have our stakeholders as independent artists, as organizations, whether that's head teachers or local businesses, the stakeholders that can, can be part of what we do. And then there is our visitors, our audiences, our participants, and a much, much wider group that we can contact. So I don't know if that helps, but just to bear those in mind as you're going out now for tea and coffee. The tea and coffee is happening in the stalls bar and the dress circle. Um, and I would ask you to do three things during this break. I would ask you to um, share some ideas with some other people. To talk about what you've heard, but also talk about what you think and what you think the ideas that we should be talking about this afternoon. Second, I would ask you to talk to people you don't know. There are an amazing, incredible group of people in this room. It is stunning to see this morning just the diversity of the different kinds of uh, organizations and geographies. So please go find somebody who you don't know and talk to them. And the third is I would ask you just to tweet and get this out there, get the message out there more broadly.